This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Richard Linkletter and Katie Kokonos. How are you guys doing? Thank you so much for being on the show, guys. Great. Good to be with you, Alex. Thank yeah, you so much. It was so much fun. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to talk to both of you uh, about uh, your latest project, uh, I Dream Too Much, the project you guys did together. Um, I know it's been around for a, a few minutes, so it's not the latest, latest project, but we're going to talk about that, that project a little bit. Um, but I wanted to kind of talk about... Um, not only um, Rick's uh, filmmaking career and what he's done, but Katie, how you how you have uh, you know come up as a director as well, and um, and all these kind of other conversations about philosophy and other things we're going to get into. But before we get started, because you actually, so because Katie, you were with Rick when you guys uh, were work. I mean, Rick, you were making Slacker, and Katie was around at that same time, correct? I first met Katie. I kind of was finishing it. Okay. You know, just right at the, you're with me at those first premieres and yeah. So. You've been friends ever since. Yes. Yes. We so, have. So let me ask you a question, Rick. What, for, for, for so many, so many filmmakers uh, coming up, especially of that magical time, which is the early nineties, uh, which is the kind of like the birth of independent film as we know it today you know i mean yes there was you know prior to slacker obviously yeah. there was a, a, a month you know and easy rider and things like that but the whole sundance you know uh for lack of a better term kind of like the, the lottery ticket kind of filmmakers like the kevin smiths and the roberts and and those kind of times you were one of the first to come out in the early 90s a lot of them look back at you like i just had ed on the ed, edward burns on the show the other day and he was talking about it was Slacker. I saw this, the breakdown of the budget of Slacker, and it gave me hope that like, oh, I could do it. There's someone else who did it. So you're like, you you broke the, the four minute mile essentially for a lot of filmmakers of that generation. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that perpetuates itself because I'm sitting there in 1989 making my first. I had made one feature before and a bunch of shorts, but I'm like, okay, I can do a no budget feature. But I, at that point, I'm thinking, you know. I was coming off, there was an 80s paradigm too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Sundance based. I think that's really the difference between the generations. It didn't have Sundance as a launch. It was just indie films, you know, John Sayles, right. Wayne Wings, Chan is Missing. There were all these like 20, um, Eagle Pinnell's a Texas filmmaker, Katie worked with and I, I knew. Um, just to make the low budget, backyard, no budget, personal, uh, movie that was a really kind of a archetype in indie filmmaking still is you know uh, that's what you can do you make what you know and it's kind of interesting and that's what I felt I was doing but at the time I, I guess it was sort of unique to Austin that did mostly like horror films and things like that right but it wasn't unique to cinema you know Shirley Clark <laughs> had done it and it had been happening in the 60s the 50s you know there's a nice history of indie cinema it just didn't really it was gaining more traction as a business as a it had an outlet there were these right. indie theater there was a lot of festivals springing up um you know cable and you know vhs tape you know there was suddenly there was an economy around it so in the 60s when you made your indie film you showed it at a few film the few film festivals you played it at you know, Jonas Mikas played it in New York and mm -hmm. they showed it at Berkeley and a few other. It was a real scrounge around thing. You know, Cassavetes would hire a bunch of young, hungry future distributors and like, hey, we're going to distribute this film. We're going to get it out there. You know, so it was just by the time I felt I came along and got lucky enough to get one of those distributors, um, the path was sort of it, it had already been it was out there. I was just like a, I was a nineties version of that. Right. And, and you, um, yeah. But when you submitted Slacker to Sundance, it got rejected, right? The first time. Yeah. The first year, 1990. Remember that Katie? Cause we got, yeah. And it wasn't quite finished, you know, when I got it there, but I was still disappointed, but you know, <laughs> came back the next year. In the meantime, I'd had a very interesting year with it. Um, 
you know, showed it in Berlin in the marketplace to four people. Uh, <laughs> uh, stop right there. How did that, how did that work? How it was a good festival. But when you, yeah. oh yeah. When you guys Seattle were was a real breaking festival because it was we were standing outside watching all these people going in and we were like they're coming to see Slacker and like yeah it's it's sold out like here's what? the difference we're in Seattle in summer of 1990 right mm -hmm. so what does it look like it looks like everybody in the film yeah you know? right. everybody in line looked like they could have stepped like, out of the film it was yeah. this perfect match. Yeah, you yeah. were preaching to the choir. I know. It was the first really great response. That really was. I had actually premiered it in Dallas. There was a thing called the USA Film Festival. Yeah. And, Richard Peterson. Uh, yeah, I got some really dismissive. I remember waking up that morning to some really dismissive, like, yeah, this might have been a good short, but it's a bunch of awesome people <laughs> not doing anything. <laughs> you know, I read these two, my first reviews ever for something I'd worked so hard on. It was just these total like poof, reviews from Dallas. And then I think, God, do I even go to the screening? I was so like, oh, they're gonna hate it. I'm in Dallas, you know, they're just but it was great. It. But we did have a very good audience response. Yeah, they totally got it. Yeah, so that was encouraging. But and then Dennis Hopper was there and- yeah, That was a really Kit fun Carson. festival. You're like, that's Kit Carson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because they were feeding Sam Arkoff. Remember, they were featured. The great Sam. Terrible name. <laughs> Mars Needs Women. Now, that's a million dollar title, $30,000 movie. Yeah. yeah, he was like, kid. Yeah, I met, it was just cool. All these, you start meeting people, you're just so enthralled with meeting <laughs> film history. Sam Arkoff. Oh, yeah, what do you, you got a film here. What, what's your name? What's the title? A slacker. Oh, bad title, bad title. Um, you you got to have, you know, like, how to stuff a wild bikini. Now that's a title. <laughs> that's a title. <laughs> that's selling foreign. <laughs> Million dollar title. Thirty thousand dollar movie. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like... <laughs> and obviously you've and obviously you've been stuffing bikinis ever since in your career. Yeah. And uh, uh, both of you guys, ever since. That's all you do. Mars needs women. women. Mars needs that's women. That's a title. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I remember watching all those movies on TV growing up. And you're meeting these guys behind it. He's like we would have the poster made before we even did the movie just to see if it worked, if we could sell it. I go, there's a genius there. Studios should do that. You know, I've made enough movies where they go, oh, we don't know how to market this. It's like, well, maybe you should have, we should have done all that before. You know, if no one wants to see a movie called this that looks like this, I mean, I'm glad I got to make it, but you only have yourselves to blame. Do what Sam Arkoff did. Roger Corman. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I mean, he's the he's the king without question. All right. So yeah. so who was so for both of you, who was the filmmaker that was that catalyst that's that you said, oh, I can make that because, you know, you could study Stanley Kubrick all day and you could study you could study the, the greats and the masters and we could all be depressed at 23 because we're not making Citizen Kane, which is the the, the, <laughs> the passage of the rites of passage of every filmmaker. Exactly. Yeah. So who was that one filmmaker that you, Rick, and you, Katie, said to like, you know what? They did it. I think I can make something. Katie, why don't you jump in? Because we're probably on different timelines there as far as when we start thinking I can do that. Well, okay. So growing up, in the 70s and watching the Hollywood renaissance of cinema, I never thought I could do it mm -hmm. because all I saw were guys' names. Uh. <laughs> and I would stay till the credits just dying to see one, one female, one Polly Platt who was the production designer, one Elaine May who was the screenwriter, you know. Um, and so director. I film. never... Yeah. I never yeah. thought I could do it. Um, and it wasn't until college where my professors were turning me on to, you know, Agnes Varda, Maya Darren, Shirley Clark, Chantal Ackerman. Um, and so for me, it wasn't a budget thing. It was more of a, I'm a woman, you know, and it looks like the boys club to me you know, Howard Hawks, John Ford, John Houston, you know, and I, so, so do what I even have to say, right. would, would that even be cinematic? 
because I don't want to shoot anybody. And yeah. I don't want to, you know, yeah. there's so many things I don't want, don't want to do. It's yeah. sort of like reading a Bukowski and going, yeah, that's great, but I'm, but I'm not an alcoholic. So, <laughs> you know, or Jack Kerouac going, but I, you know, it, you know, just those, those things. So it took me a while, um, you know, but I, I do think I remember clearly checking, um, renting last night at the Alamo and taking it over to my sister's in Houston. Cause I didn't even have a TV um, and watching it and thinking, wow, this was made for $30,000. Cause it was very well known. Eagle got that film from a, a national endowment for the arts grant. And it was all in one location. So that's when I started kind of thinking, okay, you know um, it's just, First off, it's going to take some time to 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 experience things that I even want to talk about <laughs> or even want to uh, tell a story about. Uh, but then, you know, then 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 it, you know, you just you get inspired on in stages. I think, you know, so and then you see bad movies. I mean, Werner Herzog is always telling you know, don't see you know. Um, <laughs> The masterpieces. Yeah. Don't see, you know, Chinatown. That's going to depress <laughs> you. It's going to depress you. <laughs> Watch a movie that's, that's, that's terrible. That's how you learn to make, take, to make movies. But anyway. Well, that, that kind of gives you confidence at some point. I, I see this. I just talked to a, a big class of grad students two days ago at University of Texas via, you know, Zoom, of course. But, um, the thing we ended up talking about was confidence. You know, just how do you get the confidence to lead a group? How do you get the confidence to think you're worthy of a film? I mean, I didn't have that same restriction in a certain way that you had, Katie. Like, you don't see names that make you think you're wanted. It's just the way you would as a black or brown or Asian person. He's like, that's a white space, you know? Right. I didn't, see it, even though I'm a white male, I saw it as a, white trash kid from East Texas, I saw it like, that's not open to people like me who come from where I come from. They're right. not gonna let me make a film. Why right. would they? They don't let us do anything. We're just stuck. But I didn't feel a, I also, the more I got into it, I thought, well, you know, you can work hard and I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I just, I definitely felt outsidery, but not as much as, what you were describing, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, outside, but I think as a white male, you, you definitely have, no, there's some doors you can potentially get to that, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and, and, it's, both. it's closed off, but yeah. the world of arts always feels open. I mean, every oh, musician feels that way. It's yeah. Mount Olympus. Are you kidding? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, growing up in Beaumont, Texas, you know, you'd walk into the theater, sit down and watch, you know, <laughs> Reds. I mean, you you just like you, it's hard to process. Yeah. How, so, you know. but to answer your question though, Alex, to me it was a slow formation of I went from feeling I was a writer to being a playwright. And then at age summer, when I was 20, I started watching movies seriously for the first time and very systematically. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was discovering like, oh, film. It's kind of the way my brain was working. And that was right. At the, I remember that summer I watched um, Return of the Secaucus 7, the John Sayles film. And it was there were these indie films, American indie films were happening. And then I was watching a lot of foreign films. And it was a great time. I was at these you know, repertory theaters in Houston and college, you know, I was just seeing four films a day. So it started to dawn on me that, oh yeah, you, you know, maybe you just buy a camera and you, know, you see enough indie films, but I'd studied it for several years. And it's funny, I'll reference the same movie Katie uh, talked about last night, the Alamo by Eagle Pinnell, which there's been a restoration of in the last few years. You know, I showed that film in Paris recently and I showed it in, uh, the Czech Republic. I have that film around the world sometimes when they ask me to show some films from Texas. I'll show like Tender Mercies and Last Night at the Alamo to, to show like some a variety of Texas films. But yeah, 
Eagle Pinnell got a $25,000, I think, or a $30,000 NEA grant. He had made one feature before that I hadn't even seen at the time. But it was playing at the Houston Film Festival. And I remember going to that screening and they showed it in 16 millimeter. And I was I was inspired just because it, it looked like a lot of other indie films I saw. But he had done it in Houston, the town I happened to be working out of. It just started to feel closer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It just felt closer, like, oh, okay. Point closer. Yeah. Because yeah. we grew up, Hollywood is a mythical. Yeah. <laughs> so far away. Yes. And the films yeah. come from there, and they're these special movie star Hollywood people who make them, and all we do is consume them, you know? So there's really two levels of falling in love with cin cinema as a future filmmaker. There's films that just make you love cinema, and that is your Kubrick's. And you're, you know, all those. It's like, oh my God, cinema is the greatest art form right. ever invented. You know, it's just like it's everything, but it's intimidating in its essence. But, so, but, but then don't you the think kind of films that you see and you go, oh, that's a little closer to home. That's how my brain works. Maybe I could do that. Yeah, because yeah. you can't, you can't watch 2001 and go, oh yeah, yeah, I can do that. Like that's not a conversation. I got my own version of that. Yeah, like it's yeah, it's hard. Inspired, but <laughs> I think, you're Tarkovsky. I think yeah. it's very what? important, though, and and this is this is, um, it's important that we do have the gods sitting on Mount Olympus because it's something that you need to work towards, and I think yeah. that that's where the film society came in so. Mm -hmm. So great. When I was interviewed recently from somebody from Texas Monthly asking me about the early days, the film society, um, or just working in film society. And it, it just it hit me in this talk that, yeah, you're working on Slacker, but you're also like showing some of the greatest films ever made. And yeah. it, it's this nice, you know, um, what you want it, where you're headed, where what you'd like to be, but but what you're dealing with, you know, with your own um, personal vision, your own, um, you know, uh, what you yeah. want to do with cinema. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I, I, I was talking to Katie off air uh, a little while ago, and when I asked, I kind of asked this question, she said that she hadn't seen anybody, that, you know, no no female names or anything like that. And for me, it was uh, I'm a Latino filmmaker from Miami, wow. so I didn't see any. Like there was yeah. no Latino filmmakers. So for me, it was Robert. Like he was the first one. Robert was the first one that I saw. And in 91, I was working at a video store in, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And yeah. Mariachi showed up and I went to the theater to see it. And I was just like, and it was right next to a pic, it was right next to a poster of Hard Boiled. I'll never forget. A hard boiled John Woods good. with the with the baby and the shotgun. I'm like, what is that? So that was a double feature that day. That a was, good double feature. That was a fantastic double feature. <laughs> but it was the first time that I saw someone that was and then he came out with this book and i studied all that kind of stuff but it was the first time i was inspired to like you know what and i'm not i'm not by the way by any stretch uh the alone in that he inspired multiple filmmakers but for me yeah. specifically as a latino filmmaker yeah. it was someone that really really drew me i think we all need that we all need to see ourselves yeah do, do it at a level because you know you could look at you know there's a lot of latino filmmakers out there maybe who, who look at guillermo uh, Del Toro, and they're like, "Oh, that's great," but he's at a at a whole other level. It's nice right. to see someone be able to make something like, "Oh, I just need thirty thousand bucks, and maybe I can make something." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's inspiring on a couple levels. I mean, it, it's interesting with Robert. You know, he was like a year or so two after me, mm -hmm. even though he's he's younger. And I met him around that time. But really, with Robert, all it's that last name, Rodriguez. Robert's a kid from San Antonio. Right. He didn't really speak Spanish when he made that film, like so many of that generation. He, he picked it up, you know, but it's just like, yeah, anyone can do this. And then you see those female names. It's like, and then the black filmmaker, the Gordon Parks, you know, we all just, it's, it's so funny. It's like politics, you know, just we, we're all, look, there's identity and identification. And yeah, just, representation. We need to feel open. I think that's what's so exciting about the world right now as tumultuous as it is, and I think barriers are really down for everybody. I mean, they're, they've either come down or they're coming down. I don't think anybody feels that they're technically not. Well, uh, I mean, it's still culturally, they know it's difficult, but 
I, I just think it's an exciting time when, I don't know. I, I just think the access is there. The, uh, I don't know. I, I think it's, I, I think well, you're, it's I, good. I love the Cocteau quote about film. He says it will only become an art form when it's as readily available as a piece of paper and a pen, you know, when people can, mm -hmm. can that, you know, and, and, and on another level, which he didn't also speak about, was that the representation is there too, that you feel like what my story is yeah. telling and, and it's, you know, and I can do this. I think it's only, it's, it's, it's going to, yeah, I think it's really exciting. I think you're right. It's finally come about. It was always a theoretical, you know, Francis Coppola mm -hmm. was always yeah. saying, there's that little girl in Cincinnati who's going to make a film. Well, yeah. back then, when he first started saying that, it's like, how? No one's going to give her a 35 camera. But it, it, that that thing from decades ago really has happened, you know? Mm -hmm. There's no, but, no barriers. But he also said it was the last vestiges of dictatorship filmmaking. <laughs> it's interesting. He well, did. He said that. He said that while making Apocalypse Now. Well, he wasn't in a good headspace at that point. He wasn't in a real good headspace in Apocalypse Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope it's I the last. I don't have a problem with that. I, that was not a comment. Yeah, yeah. I just wish, in the political sense, with the rise of authoritarian thinking everywhere, that it, if it was the last vestiges, <laughs> I would sign up right now. I'm worried about it. I'm worried exactly. about that spilling outside the arts. <laughs> the arts, exactly. I totally accept. Exactly. <laughs> the society, not so much. You know? Yeah. So, um, so you both um have made films of coming of age and of youth, and 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 youth kind of going, just kind of analyzing youth, and also not only youth, but specifically with uh with you, Rick, that you know, obviously over the passage of time. But I really want to kind of focus on youth because there are a lot of young filmmakers listening to this and um mm -hmm. i've got some gray in my hair right here in my beard uh so I've, I've been around the block a little bit you guys have been as well there's something that you could only see when you look back at your youth why is it and i'd love to hear your pr perspective of this why is it that youth always assumes that the world is there for them that mm -hmm. it is everything is owed to them and it should have gone here yesterday like, because I remember, wow. I, I remember when I was coming up, like, I'm like, oh, why am yeah. I not in Hollywood already? Like, I, why haven't they given me $20 million already? Why isn't is that, that happened? The frontal lobe isn't fully formed yet. Isn't that the deal? I think no. it forms when they're 24, 25. Is that, <laughs> that's just science. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell these film class, you know, that I speak to, I said, it's going to take twice as you know the world doesn't really reward your passion in the way that you put it out there it's on its own time schedule all you can do is try to outwork it you know but um yeah it's not it's gonna take twice as long it's like building a house or something it's gonna take twice as long and cost twice as much i said yeah. it's gonna it's gonna require more of you than you think you even have to give but that's not a bad thing you know it's kind of like a long-term relationship or something, you know, it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of effort you're gonna put in you're not thinking about right now. <laughs> so Alex, are you talking about the characters we created in Boyhood and I Dream Too Much? Or are you talking about youth? General, youth in general. Like, because you guys have, you guys have obviously studied and, and, and yeah. delved in those kind of characters a lot and explored youth and what it means to be young and, and the naivete right. of being young. And by the way, it, I wish I had some of my naivete back because uh, you become very jaded as you get older because you've just been around, so you just know things. But really great art is done by, I mean, Slacker, El Mariachi, Clerks. I mean, a bunch of you know young filmmakers who just did it. She's got to have it. Like They just went out and did it, not thinking about how you're going to sell it where you're going to get yeah. your money back. Who's how is this going to, you know, build my career? There's none of that thought. So there is some power in youth, but it's it's hard to it's like a wild stallion. It's hard to kind of yeah. guide it. <laughs> it's so interesting to be in the throes of that too. You're a little crazy. I remember the the era that I was doing slacker. I mean, my god, I think I was technically crazy in a way. You know, you have to be obsessive crazy. You're risking everything and you're you're kind of at this pitch of 
and there's there's no guarantees you're you're risking everything but you're so compelled to do it and that's what the the arts it should be doing scary things that you're just compelled to do and without any thought of what the well, results you, will be other than you have you have to bring yourself to the point where you cannot not right. tell the story i mean if going out to the lake and hanging out at the lake or going to the beach sounds so much nicer than sitting home alone in an, in your room, you know, cultivating and picking at your psyche and trying to create characters in a certain story. I mean, if it, it has to be almost, it has to be almost not to sound hyperbolic or yeah. but hyperbole, you know, it, it, it has to be as you breathe. I mean, it's, it's got to be air, water, shelter, and you must get this story out or else on a certain level, it, it just doesn't really make any sense. And having said that, I also recommend short films. Do as many short films as you can. Yeah. You know, just, I, you know, I did... I did. I was inspired by music. I would um, just create little narratives to songs. I did, you know, 30 second films. I did three minute films. I mean, my 10 minute film was like I was making Berlin Alexander plots. I mean, it was like. <laughs> I, I, mean, I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did tell a story in 10 minutes. And, you know, I just, I think it, it really has to be something. It's got to be steps. I'm very much into steps. You know, you don't skip things. You you value where you're at and you have to be okay with that. You know, you might go see, you know, so-and-so's biggest film that just came out. But when you come home, you got to bring it back down to what is it you want to say in the medium of film and how to how to say it, you know. And I, I do... I do think short films for me were always extremely liberating. We showed them in Austin. I mean, Raheel had her short film festival and I would walk out there going, Oh my gosh, you know, I mean, with every, um, you know, Bob Fosse film or, <laughs> or, you know, Kubrick film, there was a Stan Brackage film that made me feel just as, as happy because it was an artist figuring it out, just figuring it out, you know, and just creating your own vision. Um, but so, but isn't that like the greatest kind of films when you're actually watching a film where you, you see the artist um, figuring it out, like literally as, as you're, you're like, they didn't really know what they were doing here. They're just kind of like, oh, here they went over here and they it's, went. And it's not only with film, you could do it with, with writing, with art and any kind of art in general. Just figuring it out. I mean, I felt like all of them vendors, early films, he was figuring it out and they're so beautiful and so spiritual. I mean, I go back to Alice in the city, Kings of the road. I mean, you just, I don't know. That is kind of the nature of cinema. You know, it's a feeling thing. It's not a thinking yeah. thing. To me, that feeling too, it, it's a question the, the films are asking questions. Yes. That they're seeking answers, but they don't have an answer. Absolutely. The goal in making the film is the process of the question that they're trying to answer. It's not like, okay, I'm going to make this whole film to deliver you this answer I already have. They're quests. They're you know, they're the quests. visual quests, and you can feel that. You know, and I, I, I feel sorry for when that artist suddenly has answers. Right. And, and the, the, right. Things start to change, a little didacticism. And I hope that's not just with age. or. Right. But that is kind of the great thing about youth, because you're just talking about youth and cinema. Youth, by definition, doesn't really have answers. It's being formed. And that's why I've come back to that over and over again. I mean, mm -hmm. here recently I've made some middle, definitely some middle age films, you know, about that stage of life. But... Um, I, I think youth is always very, I don't know, evocative. We were all young once, mm -hmm. you know, we're all well, still attached to that young, unformed person who's just figuring out the world, you know. So I've done that a lot of 
just people searching for their own identities or, you know, figuring out how the world works, you know, um, that's kind of a, that's kind of a constant, you know? Well, let me, well, let me go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, I, go ahead. Well, I was just, you know, a quote that really literally hung above my computer while I was writing, I dream too much was, you know, when you're at sea, stay far from land. You know, um, because like you said, you know, when you're yeah. you're young, it you have all the all these questions and and, at, you know, and and looking back on this time where Dora's 20 years old, graduating college, one life is over and another hasn't formed. I really was trying to do like a love letter to that time saying just. Don't rush into anything. Don't want to know everything. Just be in that ditch. Be be lost. As uncomfortable as it is, there really is so so much there, you know. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm I'm really sad when I see um, kids, uh, you know, want want everything to be fixed and done, you know, the minute they graduate and they're they're. <laughs> They're done. They've got their job. They're on. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, you're just headed for a midlife crisis. You know, at, at, at 22, at 22, you're gonna have a midlife crisis. Hey, yeah. You see it though all the time. At that age, we all were. We just talked about. It. We're all impatient. We think we want tangible yeah. things from the world that because we're passionate about. It should be giving us this and yeah. Even know what you don't know, you know. I just yeah. I try to encourage young people. I said it's all about the process. I mean, your whole twenties is going to be just build that foundation under you. You know, but, read everything, watch everything, and work hard. And you know, but but both of our characters, I think it's interesting. Your character in Boyhood and my character in I Dream Too Much, yeah, essentially man. both turn to the arts. I mean, we're left yeah. with him in college with a camera. And Dora is just got up and read a poem. <laughs> yeah, she wrote. And to both of us, it was the arts what created this inner freedom, yeah. which is extremely valuable. And I just, I, I, I really can't emphasize it. Yeah, <laughs> you got to just make that leap with that. I made that. I think even as a teenager, I said, "Well, I just really wanted my life to be full of literature." and music and it wasn't even movies yet it's just the arts thinking yeah. life, expression so once you kind of jump on that path everything else is just a practical consideration like how do i pay my rent how do i raise money to make a movie that i've picked an expensive medium i wish i could just write a novel i could afford that or paint even painting oh that requires supplies and you know that can be expensive too canvases it feels it when you don't have anything right. but you know but that's the tension you have yeah. to have tension. You have to have that tension, and that's. that's well, you know, well, I think another thing I've been talking about lately. I even talked to to class and young people. I said, film really is, and I I made a short film. Uh, Katie, did you? Yeah, I saw it. I, I just oh, saw the it. The one I did, with the Pompidou, the twenty minute. Yep. Film? No. Yeah, the one with the with the therapist. No. Yeah. yeah. I saw it. I just saw it. I just saw it. You saw it? I saw it. I watched it. It's amazing. It was. I was just sitting there going, "This is a, this is awesome." And I could just tell you're just kind of like, it, the, at least the way from where I saw it. Uh, it's like another day at the office. It's called another day at the office or something. Like it's yeah. Yeah. Anything. Yeah, yeah. Another day at the office. And I'm watching it. And first of all, that conversation with the development execs or the whatever that. <laughs> I'm just yeah. sitting there going, stakes. You got to lean into it. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff was great. But when you went in with the therapist and started talking to the therapist, I truly felt that you were working stuff out. Like, that, at least from my point of view, I felt like you were. So, it was so interesting at this point in my life. Like, <laughs> seriously, that film is like the most personal thing imaginable. Katie, I'll give you the assignment. Like, in the spring of the year before, I had, oh, the Pompidou had gotten in touch with me and said, oh, next Thanksgiving, you know, well, I looked at the calendar. They said, oh, we want to do a retrospective, a, a complete retrospective of all your films and everything, but we want to fly you over. I said, would you bring my family over? And I asked, my, I have twin daughters too, Alex. Oh, I said, do oh, you guys cool. want to go to Paris next Thanksgiving? They're like, yeah. <laughs> like, you said that okay. in the short. You said that in the short. <laughs> I, I know. That's what I'm getting at. It's like, 
I made a choice in February, or no, it was even earlier. It's like, it's so far in the future. It'll be a little family vacation to Paris. Okay, I'll do it. Sure. That's kind of how you make your decisions at a certain point in life. And, <laughs> <laughs> but w with that, they said, oh, and the director who does this, you have to make a short about where you are. It's where you are right now. And I saw some others and they all did like little documentaries. So I put it off. It's like that term paper. I put it off, put it off, put it off. And then at the last minute, I said, I, over that summer, I said, well, I got to do, I started thinking about it. And I didn't do it. I actually wrote it. I wrote a script about where I really was at that moment, which was kind of in development hell on one project. And, you know, with feedback that was annoying, my transcendentalist thing. And then I, uh, yeah, visit, because I, I had kind of, been diagnosed informally for, for ADHD, which once I really got into that, it explained a lot of my own, it explained me to myself to some degree. Right. You know, I think filmmaking really is like being a director is kind of the, it's the territory for like, oh, okay, let's go on the spectrum. ADHD, Asperger's, full-blown OCD. You, you do well. <laughs> Those but, you can hang out in film because no, it's that. I have ADHD. Of you course, don't. You, I you, do. You are able to sit and focus like well, no that, I've ever met. That, that's one of the ADHD things mm -hmm. is an, a deep, uh, absolute focus on a very limited amount of things. Like, okay. Yeah, that's what I found out. Like I was a ter I was a really mediocre student because my brain wasn't couldn't process. It was thinking. So Me too. Yeah, but I did have the, my one gift, and that's what came out in this therapy session. So goes, well, you know, <laughs> you took a test, and so I really just wrote it like a short. So I'm actually I'm an actor in yeah. a movie. It's all scripted, but it looks like kind of a documentary. But what I love but about it, but, but what I love about it, right, let me interrupt you. But what I love about it is when you're talking to the studio execs, you're like feeding horses and yeah. doing stuff on the farm and you have your like your earbuds on. And I'm just like, that's just <laughs> so brilliant. And so brilliant. like with the one line, I think it was just the one line you said that just it, it just rang so true. One line that you said that they said that like, well, you know, if that thing is not in there, I think it was something like if that line's not in there, if that part is not in there, uh, why why uh, no one's going to miss it not either, we wouldn't miss it yeah, yeah and then you said well if we didn't make the movie no one would miss it either which was just the best <laughs> comeback line ever i was like yes so great i'm so yeah. stealing that in the next meeting i have with studio X. oh my god that's amazing <laughs> that's kind yeah. of like I've been sitting on that line for a while where did you see that did you go on the pompadour it's, website no it's on youtube it's on YouTube. Okay, Katie, you can watch okay. it. I'll send, I'll send you a link. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh, so I'm much fun. 20 minutes short. I felt great. Because, you know, before I made a couple features, I, I made about 20 shorts. Yeah. yeah. For when my first short got over, yeah, I made a 15 minute, no, it was yeah. like a 17 minute epic. I was like, oh my God, it took me right. six months. It, right. it was like, oh. Yeah, right. so it's, yeah. it's a little intimidating because you're like, your head's in the clouds with the greatest films ever made, but you do. Yeah. It, filmmaking absolutely necessitates you pull your head out of the clouds and out of your own ass and focus on your, the reality in front of you. <laughs> like, okay, here's who I am. Here's what I got. How do I work from here? You know, that's all you can do. And people who can't do it are the ones whose brains are just too far, too far ahead of themselves and not accepting and also accepting it's a real craft. It takes a long time to kind of get, you can have these flashes of, you know, it, it, it just takes a long time for your skills to catch up with your ideas. Put it like that. Oh, you that's know, a, that, that is, I could not have put it more perfectly. Yeah. Because when I, when I walked onto, onto, into film school, I went to a, a film school in, in Orlando and I walked onto a set and I had like, shots and things laid out because I've been studying Scorsese and Kubrick and I had these all these like you know no cut takes and everything I had no idea how to do any of this 
None, right. none what's, you just know, I didn't even understand it, but my ideas were so, even to this day, I have yeah. ideas that cost lots and lots of money. I have a little yeah. bit better understanding of how to do it, but you right. really, when you're young, you just, your ideas are so far ahead of your skill set. It's pretty fascinating. So, yeah, bring it, bring it back to reality. That's, that's always the challenge, but you know, I admire the guys who, you know, can, create this unreality and get it you know the, the kubricks are the the yeah fantastic. He, he never made napoleon no he sure but didn't. he did but he, did, he didn't film. he didn't make napoleon he didn't make uh what is it the the oh, the, the papers so, yeah, yeah the, so many people it's a frustrating thing remember antonioni wrote that book toward the in the last i guess 15 years of his long life it was just it was called bowling alley on the T tiber <laughs> and it was <laughs> all the films he's never going to make just like a page or these yeah. ideas. And, you know, I have a, I have a book of those myself, but it's important to probably not make every film that crosses your mind, but it's, a, it's, it's great. If a, the film that crossed your mind is still in your mind, 10 years later, 20 years later, you sh maybe you should pursue that. Well, that is, that is a good point. I mean, I do think I do give certain ideas a test of time and yeah. you're mm -hmm. still, if it's still kind of gnawing, then then you got to kind of start putting it down in paper and, you know, bringing it down. Into, but that's because there's different kind of filmmakers, though. Yeah. Someone like we mentioned Kubrick numerous times. He didn't do that. He he was looking for a great narrative out in the world because yeah. he himself, it's a different skill set to create a great character out of scratch, you know? Yeah. To create a great story. He, he, he talked about a great cinematic story is like a pop song. It's a really rare thing and you only right hard to like a pop hit, you know, right. it, it, it's really hard. So he was looking for that, that narrative that he probably on his own blank slate, not his skill set. That's right. not the, his brain works. Yeah. He's a thing stories. That doesn't mean you're not a great, you know, so there's a kind of filmmaker who's working super close to home in a personal way, characters coming out of their own lives. A lot of people don't do that. They're they're uh, really taking the the form. Kubrick yeah. wanted to make a science fiction movie that didn't suck, you know, about space travel. That's where he started. He right. started with genre and the form, and he just knew he had something in him. So right. and and that's that's really valid, you know. So many great filmmakers work that direction. I think the indie world, by nature, we all work the other direction you know well, you work more right. like Fassbender where Fassbender wanted to make sure that he actually what he experienced actually did he actually did experience the emotion of yeah. it so then he would um you know create from there now I wanted to, I wanted to touch uh, something about both of your films. Um, your your film I Dream Too Much and 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 kind of a, a bunch of your films uh, in your filmography, Richard. I mean Rick. Um, the 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 spiritual the spiritual aspect of your projects and your characters and the journeys that they make the spiritual um, philosophical too. I mean obviously the first scene in Slacker with you spouting off philosophy uh you know, pretty much set the tone for your career uh in so many ways but the spiritual aspect of things um i'd love to hear it because i see um, and this is just my interpretation of, of the art i see it in both in both your work um a spiritual undertone in it is that something that you are placing in it um purposefully or are you kind of organically it just comes out of the characters uh, because there's definitely something there and majority of of, of your work, Rick, and as well as yours, um, Katie. I was always kind of obsessed, or naturally I fell in with the, uh, what Schrader calls the transcendental, you know, style in film, the Ozu's, mm. Rasson, Dreyer, yeah. Mizuguchi, you know, you, you Bergman, Tarkovsky, you know, the people who had these kind of spiritual concerns, and you see it in, in it's, it's in a lot, you know, it shows up in American cinema plenty, too. It's just usually, you know, it's, it's around the edges of narratives often. It's not the sole subject. But, um, yeah, I, I think it just kind of, if you think 
film is kind of a, a spiritual art on some level. That sounds kind of pretentious, but I don't know when you're talking about life and representing, I don't know, the world. And I, I think that's there, but I don't, I never had anything I really wanted to say <laughs> in that, on that front. I really don't. I don't have any practice or anything. I think it's just what's on the mind of young people and how they communicate and what they're going through. Or maybe there's some magical thinking sometimes that particularly at certain points in your life, you know, and I feel, I felt myself change, you know, like I go back even 20 years to, I wouldn't be making waking life today probably because I just think differently about certain things. I'm, I'm more skeptical. I'm more science based. I kind of had these ideas or I think I used to be a little more into just the pure aesthetic of ideas, whether, I mean, you see it a lot in slacker, the conspiracy thinking, the, the kind of, I'm just calling them magical ideas. Not that they're that necessarily, but just, just alternative ways of thinking, let's say mm -hmm. that really, interested me a lot you know um i felt that that was very real in the world it was a, a certain kind of buzz of the world i was experiencing and you could say it's kind of schizophrenic it's kind of crazy but i thought well that's the world that's the what i'm feeling but that was a certain age and i don't know you kind of see it play out in the public arena like say conspiracy for instance and that's taken on a real malevolent yeah. i think super damaging where it was kind of fun in the eighties to talk about, Oh, some of this stuff. I don't know. I just think when it's kind of the ideology now of a large percentage of our population, I, what I want now is like, well, it's, I don't know. I want verify. I want like us to be on the same page. I want there to be like actual deeper thinking and factual, you know, but I, I don't think that affects the film so much, but, it's just, I don't know, certain flights of fancy, maybe not so much. Got it. How about you, Katie? Well, I think it, um, I think it sort of circles back to what we were talking about, about the question, you know, the filmmakers who are seeking questions. And yeah. to me, that that's spiritual, you know, and, and Rick, you were very, you know, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Knut Hampson, you know, these were all writers that were very much alive to you and inspired you. And they certainly, um, you know, come from a very spiritual place. Um, you know, I, I, um, you know, I think of, of a film, like you said, Tender Mercies, where mm -hmm. there is, you know, Horton Foote was going after something something else but his person says keep the important stuff hidden <laughs> you yeah. know and i and i wonder again i wonder you know through that tension of of telling a, a story but but trying to connect it to something greater and something that that we could all participate in does sort of make it a, something a little bit more spiritual you know, I mean, um, I, I, don't I mean, know. to me, like to me, boyhood, like it, it's 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 a commentary on the human condition. I mean, there's no mm -hmm. question and about the journey of this, this, yeah. this soul, this, this boy going through life. And also not only that, the parents, as as you get older, you like I watched it when it first came out. And then now as as a father of older yeah. children, you just are like. Oh, I ooh, I feel it different. And that's what good art does. It, it changes with you as you get older. Um, but there is, I mean, I guess, I guess anytime you're dealing with the human condition, there's in many ways you touch, you touch the spiritual in, in, in some, yeah. in some way, yeah. some way, somewhere, some way or another without being like, I'm not talking about religion or anything like that. I'm just talking about just yeah. the, the, the human condition. I know. I think we're all looking for connection. That's what makes cinema such a powerful medium because you can really, it, the spirit kind of permeates the images sometimes. Yeah. It really does. If you're not it's too didactic like, about it, you just you lay it out there and let. We're all feeling, yeah, wanting to connect. You know, in a, a film like Boyhood, I, I, I was kind of amazed, but on the other hand, I, I wasn't. It, it's sort of what I was going for, but the way people did connect to it. Even all those years, I was thinking like, 
am I not going, I'm not going very big here. I'm, I'm making it about this minutia of life. Right. I'm not, I'm not even doing the first kiss. I'm making it the little things I remember and just the smallest things. But I had a, I had a great belief in the cumulative power of, of that, of time and what that would maybe just feel like as a human to experience watching it, you know, like just to see life, to mm -hmm. see time move like that. That's what I thought would be interesting. I didn't want to weigh it down with a lot of uh, heaviness. I mean, it's plenty heavy. It's got a lot of detail mm -hmm. that runs the gamut. But I just thought the, the physical process, I did kind of think it would be this kind of moving thing. So it was amazing to me to, to get the feedback from people saying, what they liked about it and it was unique to i mean it was very similar every time it's like oh my parents divorced or you know my kid went off to college or i just went off to college or you know it was always some detail from the film triggered so much from their own life so i got to hear so mm -hmm. many people's life stories or you know what they connected and i said oh that's really beautiful that people are just connecting with some aspect but every film you, you go for that. The, the thing is with Boyhood, it was an overabundance of it because that's all there was. <laughs> you know? so I got back an overabundance. But I, I like a film if I can just, if, if there's a couple of scenes that take it to that level that you just get a rush of feelings. You think maybe the whole movie moved up was for that one moment. Right. You know, look on someone's face or just a contemplation of something. It's, but it, it's going to be different for, you know, you just got to leave some room for it, but it's, it's really just how you got to give the, you got to give the power to the medium we're in. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, it, you have to acknowledge the power of cinema and work with that. You don't have to, it, it carries so much itself you just have to work with it i think and then uh, also uh, katie in your film i dream too much um the grandma character and, and so many characters in your films as well rick um I, I find that you know human beings as we are we constantly are carrying our past with us and it completely determines our future we're unique as an animal species on this planet we're the only ones that do that i mean there's not many dogs who are carrying around their past and and, and really affecting their future so much why do you think we do that to our detriment? Like it is, we know consciously it's hurting us, but yet we still kind of thrive in it. And I know a lot of characters in your in your films do that because that's the human condition. I just love to hear your take on that. Well, I mean, it's funny to having just watched the Ken Burns, Ernest Hemingway oh. um, series that was on. It reminded me how Aunt Vera I was really, I created her in honor of, you know, Hadley Hemingway or Martha Gellhorn, you know, one of the, the you know, married to the great journalist and she gets cast aside uh, for a younger woman and they fake their death. And, um, you know, I, I, I completely forgot about that and how Vera holds on to it. It becomes like her her reason of being and Dora kind of <laughs> lands lands into this into this world and they both figure it out but um uh so you're asking what, why why we why, do it why we do it as a as a as a species hold on to things yeah wait a wound is sacred I'm sorry? i mean you feel it it takes you out of the ordinary you, no, you, but to our detriment, not like hold on to the past, like the good stuff, but like we have things that like we hold on to that constantly are hurting us and hurting our forward motion completely. I've done that in my life where an incident happens and, and you well, just hang on to it and you, it stops you from going anywhere. Why? Well, I think you create a narrative. I oh, mean, absolutely. You, you have a trauma, then you, you form a narrative around it and then, you know, you create to live up to that narrative that's who you are and you create it until you you know sit down and write a script about it <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's a choice you know it seems like we're in some therapy session but yeah that narrative is are you the hero overcoming great odds right or seeing through all the muck that's been thrown at you or are you the victim who's held back by these traumatic you know it's like you can, you know, we do have to some degree, you know, 
how we where we put it, you know, in our compartments. You know, you can hide it away completely. You can deal with it. You can, you know, my yeah. sister said watching Boyhood. It's like, oh, we went to therapy. You made a movie. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or you can just our own upbringing. It's like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was had an allergic thing to therapy, but I wanted to deal with, with some of this somehow. So again, yeah. the art, the art solves all problems. It well, really does. It's therapy. Right. You know, that's uh, why. Say, what, yeah. What about religion? I said, you know, all the great things that are in the great holy books. I said, you know, all that exists in the arts and science. You know, if you really focus on arts and science, all the questions are there. All, so many answers are there. And all the beautiful mystical feelings are there. Everything's it's been expressed throughout time. You know, there's it's, it's so much there. You know, if religion's not doing it for you. And you have this other thing. It's really tangible. So I just I really do believe in the arts as a sort of church <laughs> as, a, as it, it will provide all meaning and well, context. Yeah. And myth and whatever you whatever you're questing for, you know, it's it's all there. You know, Well, even Brisson quotes the liturgy in his notes on cinematography. Um, I mean, you know, the the. I'm Greek Orthodox and the liturgy on Sunday was supposed to do what art does. I mean, you get the whole operatic vision in front of you for an hour and a half. You're supposed mm -hmm. to, and you're supposed to walk out going, ha, huh, I feel so much better. <laughs> but now I think art is, is now, you know, that taking over that. Uh oh, there, Oh there no, he did. And he just oh, busted no, it out. Not. Did you get a first edition? Sign. Oh. Look at you. You see? All right. Now you're just now you're just bragging. Now, now you're just, just bragging. mean. <laughs> now you're just bragging. Uh, Do you Rick. Know that? Look at what that. It was a little it? personal letter of authenticity. Letter of authenticity. <laughs> yeah, it was a gift. It was a gift someone gave me. That's awesome. Isn't that, that amazing? That's that amazing. amazing. I had it right here on my shelf. I thought I Saint Robert. That, that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> I'll have to bust out my George Lucas autograph and my Kira Kurosawa as well. So uh, <laughs> I've got my good. Lindsay Anderson. He autographed my John Ford, the John Ford book he wrote. Oh, that's amazing. I don't know where it is though. Well, one thing. One thing you said. <laughs> I uh, think of Lindsay. Huh? No, I'm sorry. No. I think of Lindsay quite a bit and I carry the torch for him. Lindsay Anderson, you know, my daughters have recently become very cinema literate. Just finally, this la the pandemic put us together in a theater once a day to watch a movie. And they're, what are we watching tonight? Before I thought I'd lost them to, you know, YouTube, ever, all the other things that kids are distracted TikTok. by. But they, yeah, yeah, they finally kind of got cinema and we watched so many movies, but their favorite film and these are kids who just turned 16, was If, and then the whole Mick Travis trilogy, going back and revisiting wow. those was really profound, truly radical, beautiful movies. I just admire him so much, and we were lucky to have hung out with him. Yeah, the sporting life is oh, not be shown we enough. Watched, we watched that. And did you see Malcolm McDowell's No Apologies, his documentary about... Yeah. Malcolm McDowell did this one man show. It's just him on stage with slides and images. And it's really all about Lindsay, his relation with really? Lindsay and his own career. But it's beautiful. You can get it on Vudu. You can rent it on Vudu. Just no apologies. Okay. Lindsay, Everyone. Malcolm McDowell's tribute to Lindsay Anderson. It's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, like from a... Um, to a mentor and a great artist from a guy whose life he affected profoundly, who That's loved him dearly and, and kind of saw the contradictions and frustrations Lindsay went through personally, professionally. You know, it's, it's great. It's a great portrait. That's wonderful. And one thing that you said earlier, Rick, you said that um, it's going to take twice as long and you're going to work twice as hard than you think, <laughs> which is a great, by the way, great, great quote. Can you just... Just dig a little deeper into the patience. <laughs> and you, and you, and you're gonna. There's one more thing, and if you, and if it's meant to be, you're gonna love every minute of it. You know, 
Yeah, that's a that. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's a great addition to that quote. Because you're you're doing what you love in this life. You're serving your cinematic, uh, you know, destiny. I I look back at those years where I I would just tape the windows. I blacken my windows and edit around the clock for mm-hmm. just days and days just to finish that short that no one was ever going to see. But I was like, what was driving me? Why was I wasn't a good boyfriend? I wasn't a good. I didn't go do anything. People would ask me out for dinner. I'd like, no, I, I'm, I'm. There's a film I'm watching at 7:30, and then I'm that. And I just didn't have time. I was so obsessed and on a track, you know that. And I look back at those were kind of like the greatest years ever because I was just. It was something pure about just doing exactly what you wanted to do with your time. And when it when you're fully dedicated to something like cinema, which is so multifaceted. For me, that meant, you know, starting a film society. It was booking films, but it was watching films. It was seeing every film, it was editing, it was writing film. You know, you can really dedicate your life to this if you see it just, especially outside just your own thing. You know, it's a bigger, cinema's much bigger than all of us, you know? So there's a lot to contribute to. So, it really can be a, a, a life. To call whatever it. it gives you, whatever it gives you back, you know, it's like what you what you put in. You know, it's kind of like sports. You know, you get back what you put in, and uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think cinema is so heartbreaking. Oh yeah! yeah. Oh yeah! But there's I that. Think it is incredibly <laughs> heartbreaking. Well, so is sports. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. You, you give it. You know, it's like I was just saying things that the athlete or the artist devotes their life to. I think they're by definition heartbreaking. You know, I mean, you talk to these people who have successful you would look at it and go, oh, that's a successful career. And you get a little closer and there's a lot of heartbreak there. A lot of disappointment. It's just how you categorize it. You know, well, I mean, mean, it's. Well, but with both of you, I'm sure. I mean, I know Rick. You you've gone. You've obviously you have obviously had some highs, but you've also had lows. And even to this day, you're still hustling to get your movies made. And that's the thing that filmmakers, young filmmakers, think that like, oh, it's Rick Linklater. Mm-hmm. He's he's this and that. And and as I, I talk to more and more <laughs> filmmakers that are accomplished filmmakers, I've just I completely understand that. Like, no, man, I. Still, I'm hustling for the money. I'm still trying to get my projects made. Like, it's not like they just, oh, well, you want, you got nominated for an Oscar. Well, here's how many, yeah. how many $20 million checks do you want? Like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> really? So, it's amazing. Yeah. People, when they think like, oh, you have trouble. I was like, well, I'm having trouble getting this particular thing made. Maybe, maybe it's, I don't know, not fitting into the marketplace, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's no, easy path although i i do think certain friends of mine or certain people i know they seem i think they're pretty made you know they get to do whatever they want but i look at them and go well they kind of earn that you know in a way i haven't so i'm like okay uh, i'm not complaining you know you're if you're on the roster but yeah Look, look, Scorsese, Scorsese still having problems. i mean spielberg couldn't even get lincoln financed so i mean they still there is moments that you know they still got oh, hustle yeah. <laughs> oh well, he got it financed eventually. It's just sure. they're so affronted by the the initial fear mm. that the world the world gives you. Like, didn't I remember when he took uh, Schindler's List into <laughs> Universal? I guess it was, <laughs> and the head of the studio, can't we just make a donation to some Holocaust thing? Oh my god! Oh my god. <laughs> and, and, and that's the kind of thing Spielberg, someone like Spielberg, you don't forget that. And that didn't mean it didn't happen, but it's that that initial, the world gives you, no matter what you say, it gives you a little stiff arm back. So can it, we just It's a ask. smart comment or it's something, but you know, you're not supposed to feel sorry for those people. You're no. just supposed to know the world doesn't necessarily want to give you everything you want, you know? Well, even between Slacker coming out in 91, which I think this is 2021. Isn't this an anniversary? Is it 30 year? We're in between our Austin premiere 30 year and our national will be, um, yeah, next summer or this coming summer. Between, between 
Slacker, and then with my first film, Portrait of a Girl as a Young Cat, which came out in 2000, I was I was hearing from independent, you know, distributors and um, festivals, you know, well, do you have any names attached to it? Yeah. So this independent yeah. became Indiewood, you know, that it became commodified where you needed, you know, names to get it out there. So it's just this constant like flux of, you know, what can we sell? What can we sell? Yeah. That is the the kind of the the shadow side of what we were kind of rhapsodizing about the Sundance era, um, yeah. indie this renaissance. What went with that is commercial expectations and yeah. this amped up industry, you know, minor league system with names attached for no money. Yeah, so there there was always been that, you know, that, yeah. that there, there's kind of an inflation that ran through it all that kind of you know you could say like Miramax sort of ruined <laughs> Miramax and then later Fox <laughs> Searchlight when they kind of landed on these formulas and this is just yeah. pure business but you know it was really kind of insidious it's like how they made money and they worked a formula that <laughs> they would just overspend they'd over advertise overtake build up grosses and then take their cut and then have it all just stop right at the point they're supposed to pay the filmmakers. <laughs> the, you know, right at the point it was gonna achieve, they were taking their fee off the top. So wow. I was like, wow, what what a what a kind of businessy, awful formula <laughs> that started working. And and then it wasn't it wasn't enough to you know, Slacker, they gave us 100000 in advance. It made $1.3 million at the box office. It was seen as successful. They made some money. It just, it, that was okay. It was in it, the sports tournament. You, it, they were hitting singles and doubles. That's okay. But it became a much bigger thing. And everyone started sort of playing that game. So, you know, you just got to deal with inflationary right. time, well, inflationary right. expectations, you know. And Slacker, if Slacker comes out today, it it's it's drowned out. Do you do you agree? You know, you I'm think? of two minds. Part of me says yes. You know, it wouldn't get into the narrative competition at Sundance. It would definitely be a midnight or or at at best. You know, you you think that, but then you, I also go, well, there's still room for that film that is so weirdly different to to find a path so i part of me the optimist in me has to believe that you know it, it would find a way the way it did then you know it was just a different film it didn't have a story there was so much it wasn't but right. what it was but i mean it's a product of its time too you know it's very much i mean in, in a way it, it spoke to a moment in time yeah well, this, the agenda was cinematic, but it kind of not that it was a design of the film, but like anything that just kind of catches a zeitgeist or pop culture wave, right. that's right. just that's right. just luck. And I think that's just being it's that's kind of the the upside of naive youth. Like you don't know it, but <laughs> right. you're 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 surfing on some waves that are in the culture that are youthful and different and you know so that's what music does so well now you guys worked on a project together uh, i dream too much which was directed and written by by katie so katie can you tell us a little bit about that project and then how did rick get involved in that project yeah yeah um i let's see i had done portrait of a girl as a young cat that came out in 2000 and then i it's great great um, by the way great title i mean not as much as stuffing yeah. stuffing the bikini title that we talked about earlier i mean not that good but still good yeah well i i do have to recommend to uh listeners out there that a, a good title really helps you write every day and something that you don't know what it is like, I really didn't know what a portrait of a girl as a young cat was while I wrote it. So it was something to write towards. And the same with I Dream Too Much. I didn't really know 
what that meant. So it really helped sitting down um, and and creating these characters and creating a plot um, to do. I with I dream too much. I really wanted to capture, like I had mentioned earlier, that time right after college, um, when you're done with college and your life hasn't begun yet. And so you're, you're, yeah. you're moving away from one life, but, but nothing's been created yet. So I, I always saw my character Dora as sort of in a ditch, um, throughout the writing, uh, just not, not sure where, where she was going. Uh, her last name was Wells, by the way. It also helps. <laughs> Because I thought about Orson Welles every time I sat down, <laughs> in good ways and bad ways. Um, so yeah, so she she wants to travel. She wants to go to Brazil. She's just graduated, and her mom wants her to go to law school, which that was me uh, graduating from college. My dad wanted me to go to law school, um, so it was a little personal. Um, she uh, Dora uh, takes off, goes upstate. New York. We shot um, in upstate New York over three weeks during one of the snowiest times ever, February of 2014. Um, so I made my Dr. Zhivago uh, movie too. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, she goes to live with her Aunt Vera and, um, and she, you know, uh, through the story, she, and by the end, she sort of decides what Definitely what she doesn't want to do, but maybe what she might want to do. Um, it, I, there were no, unlike Portrait, which was very much influenced by Jacques Demy and Godard, like Viva Savi. Um, I dreamed too much. I really didn't think about any other films. There weren't a lot of coming of age with female character films I could really go to. So I looked at Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point I realized I really wanted to write a story as if Jane Austen lived in 2014. Um, so it, it very much draws upon the themes of the poor relation going to live with the wealthy mm -hmm. relation, you know, it's a lot of walking <laughs> in landscapes and, and there's even a running thread throughout it where she actually sort of daydreams that she's in a Jane Austen right. uh, movie. So anyway, it was, it was really fun. It, like I said, it was definitely like this love letter to that, that time in your life where um, things are open, you know, but there is, there is a little bit of anxiety too. So and then Rick yeah. and, and Rick, you've never, if, yeah. if I'm not, you've never EP'd a film before. You never executive produced a film like that, or have you? Uh, or like some docs, right? And other things, but I don't think a narrative. I don't think I had no. So yeah, how did you get involved with the project? Well, as I remember, Katie, like only a year or two before, a couple you had a different one. The girl, the girl vanishes. vanishes. Yeah, the screwball. So that's what you were sort of going on that, and then you did a segue into this. Yeah. You know, okay, all your energy went there. So I thought, well, that's really interesting. And I just love the script. I love what it was about. Like I've I love that territory, obviously. I've done it from a let's you know, kind of a male point of view, let's say. I just think there's it's female, young female, that that thing is woefully underrepresented. Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought, oh wow, and you're the one to do it because I know it was so alive with you, so personal. Yeah. Just knowing you that law school tension and that yeah. the parental and all that i just thought it was beautiful and i just loved your cast too when you got eden and diane ladd they're just so perfect i just thought yeah. you did a great job so it was just fun to see you um get that chance you know so i i didn't really do anything <laughs> but i came and visited and i was there you know well no uh, i mean having, yeah having your your name attached absolutely helped us navigate and get well, going I would, that's why I, I don't do it casually you know i wouldn't right. just yeah I, I only did it on something i truly believed in it would it would right. you know if it called i would answer you know it wasn't and, and you know alex when i was writing the script early on i kept thinking oh rick is really gonna like this story because it had a <laughs> lot of you know a lot of ideas working out and 
you know, oh. talking and it, it, it had a, you know, I, I, I did have him in the back of my mind when I was, was writing it. Um, and, uh, Diane was really fun to work with. I, I have to say when we first met her, um, in California, she lives out in Ojai. We had lunch. I was with my two producers, Jay and Jack, and we sit down for lunch and she all of a sudden starts telling me a story about working with Tennessee Williams and how she told, <laughs> and I told Tennessee, he needs to change this ending. And he did. And I thought, Oh my That's God, amazing. I, mean, I nearly, <laughs> I nearly, <laughs> but, you know, like what, you know, things coming up. I was like, Oh my God, she's telling Tennessee Williams how to write. What is, yeah. what is going to be what get into? Cause if, if she can get Tennessee Williams, yeah, what she gonna say? The yeah, actors are all that first meeting can. You're setting a relationship tone. You got to be careful. Oh my God, it was. <laughs> yeah, that was very telling. I mean, you know, um, so, well, so she, had, she had great. She had great stories about working. You know, Alice doesn't live here anymore. You know, she told yeah. Scorsese that he needed another shot of Ellen Burstyn in, in some scene and. Um, you know, working with, uh, with, um, oh, you know, David Lynch on Wild at Heart and, you know, working on Chinatown and yeah, she's so great to work with, but yeah, that initial meeting, I mean, Tennessee Williams, <laughs> not the iguana. Well, oh my God. I think what she's telling you, and it's a good lesson is that writers, directors, you, you have a lot to learn and a lot to benefit from listening to the yeah, people absolutely. who are physically manifesting your ideas via acting in your movie. Absolutely. You know? And I, I think a lot of them have run into younger directors who don't want to, who think, oh, what I wrote a year ago is perfect. I don't want you uh, messing it up. And it's like, no, if you uh, really want to, you know, it's a collaboration. Yeah. I think they're kind of telling them, actually the best directors, listen, listen, very closely to who they're working with and those those so much that next level getting it to that yeah you know, that level comes from that collaboration so she's just absolutely that is the best i mean you know if it's all in the script why make the movie you know you have to have <laughs> you have to have that actor the input you have to take it to a whole other level and, and it's also the lightning that you're going to capture on set like there's that lightning in a bottle that you have to be yeah. prepared for yeah you got to leave room for it yeah you, know? you got it's it's you're you're leaving you know that seven percent or that ten percent or whatever you know i'm a big rehearser and i sometimes make actors nervous or going in the oh rehearsing is it going to be like acting exercises are they going to be laying down on the floor uh recalling it's like la 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 i said well, my rehearsals are actually my rewriting i do yeah. it for me i want to hear you say it and i want to talk about yeah. it i want to answer all your questions i want to have new ideas right now, this is a process for me i'm still discovering this movie i don't i'm not 100 percent sure yet how i'm going to shoot it you know i'm not i'm feeling my way through this no, I think that's great. And I sort of did one of these as God is my witness. I will never make a movie where I don't get rehearsal because I got no rehearsal time with my actors. And we were shooting five pages a day. And wow. I just, it, it, you know, well, I just would have loved just to have a few days just to, because I, you know, I don't want to hear my writing back. I want them to, and it was great. One time, Danielle Brooks, um, you know, in a scene, she just came up to me. She's like, I just, I don't get it. I don't buy it. It's, you have to rewrite it. I was like, great. So I had to rewrite this whole scene and it made it so much better. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I, that's what I live for. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I try to do that weeks before the production. I know. <laughs> you know? I, know. <laughs> I know. Well, like I said, on my next film, I want, I just, yeah. uh, well, a, week, just a week of rehearsal. You know, you know, you know, you know, Early on, someone told me, it's like, for every week of rehearsal, you save a day of production. Yeah. That's mm. a pretty rich formula, because a day of production is expensive, and a day of rehearsal costs very little. Right. It's, you get these bureaucrats who, 
they just want to keep actors away until they're necessary. You know, like, oh, no, they're going to come in and need things for two, three weeks. <laughs> Like, yeah, a hotel room. It's really expensive. <laughs> Food. You know, your budget. Yeah, it's just yeah. they live here and we're going to work and we're going to make a better movie. I am yeah. so glad to hear you say this. It's I mean, not, I knew you. Yeah. I knew you, but I, you yeah, I, I don't. This I next hear, film. I have the insecure director and I, the, the, my nightmare that I dream. Probably every six months I have this dream where I'm on a, my own set shooting and I'm meeting actors for the first time. Mm -hmm. I don't oh. know them. I don't know who they are. And we're trying to work together. And then pretty soon I realized, oh, I don't even know my own movie. Like, what's this trip? You know, I'm just lost. Not That's prepared. eight and a half of you. That's yeah, so I watched that again recently. The new Criterion, beautiful. Obviously. Uh, Obviously. But uh, uh, it is that kind of fear of just not being prepared but for me that's a comfortableness with the cast that i want them to be comfortable and i want to be comfortable so rick when you do get rehearsal because i this this uh film on my script i'm working on now is a is more of an ensemble like a family yeah, ensemble yeah. piece so when you do get rehearsal do you find you don't have to talk as much on the set to the actors I mean, you don't have to, because they walk in, they're like, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're doing that scene we worked on. And ideally, if you can do it with your in pre-production, if you have the locations, yeah. I like to have blocked it on the set before. Right. So you're not spending the morning while the crew's waiting around, figuring out, oh, let's, then you yeah. walk through that door. I'm figuring out with the geography. Right. Do right. all that. I, I've been in a position plenty where I'm in rehearsals and then I have to go to the set separately but if you can get the actors there yeah and then kind of just feel you then they're that much more comfortable that they're right. like oh let's go so i'm a big i'm a big rehearse on location yeah the location wow well, that's just a whole other hang thing. out with no with no clock ticking let's just yeah. hang out on the weekend talk yeah. about it uh and feel our way through it it's really processed very organic and it just makes everybody more relaxed a little more confident yeah, that's yeah, awesome. I mean, the location changes everything too, mm -hmm. just like Antonio. You have new ideas, you know. Yeah. Like it's these words you're hearing out loud for the first time via the person who's going to say it, and then these locations you found, let's say, in the last couple months <laughs> yeah. or recently, and you know you're you're kind of putting those together, and that's really like how you're going to shoot it, how you're going to, yeah, you know, yeah. I, like you're just feeling your way through your own movie, and that's okay. And I, I wish people would respect that. You know, what they ask of directors is to answer questions. And I get it. You have to answer questions all day long. And as Truffaut says in Day for Night, sometimes I even have the right answer. I even know the answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, they need, and I learned early on to not be vague because, you know, it's people don't want to hear that from the boss that, oh, I'm feeling my way through, you know. Yeah. If you're managing a restaurant, like, hey, do we like, oh, I don't know, man. You're like, no, oh, we want to, people who are working for people, they want answers. They want, so I, I, I learned early on, have those answers, but also have the right to change your mind. You know, if you, you can be with the, loca the locations person asks you, hey, we're going to, you need to park the trucks here. Are you going to see there? And, you know, like, okay, we won't see out that window. So you can park there, you know, whatever. Just yeah. To the best of your ability, answer their question, but then also say, then a few times in the production, you'll go up and, hey, you know what I told you the other day? It's changed. They'll respect it because you gave them 97 answers and three times <laughs> changed it. Well, who they really hate is the person who gave them zero answers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. You know, yeah. if you can yeah. say, hey, I'm going to give you, I'm process oriented. Things change. I'm looking for it to change a little. But if we were shooting today, we, yeah, you can park the trucks there and here. But, yeah. So plan on that. I will let you know the second that if, when, and if that changes. You got to run efficient. But they have to. You, got, you need everyone to buy into your process. You know, and there's a million. It right. takes. It took me a few films to get that buy-in. It was. It's nothing but like, oh, here you're working with a lot of professionals. Here's how we do it. Here's how we make a movie. And it's like, well, that's not how I want to. That's not going to make my movie. I'll, I'll accept 
you know, the yeah. parameters of a schedule, a budget, a call sheet, you know, overtime, meal penalties. That's all bad enough. But <laughs> don't tell me I can't rehearse because the actors are professionals and will come in and say they're lying. You know, don't don't tell me things like that. You know, I will. They don't need to rehearse or <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, guys, I'm good. Day. You, you, you know what I love the day for night too is when the, that that guy comes up to him and is like, "Why aren't you doing a movie about pollution? And why <laughs> are you wait? Why are there's more sex? You know, you need more sex, more pollution. You know, pollution is something we need to deal with. And it's like, yes, right? I mean, you, <laughs> those those questions will never go away. You know, on the set. <laughs> Why aren't you, you know, and the Godfather oh. is playing around the corner and, you know, it is. It's like, like he says, it's you get on a stagecoach <laughs> and then yeah. you take off and you have no idea if you're going to make, make it. To and, your, and the bot and the bottom and the bottom line is everybody on set knows that they can make a better film than you. Everybody knows <laughs> that they can make a better film than yeah. you. Well, so. you certainly do your first like two or three films. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, yeah, you hopefully have some some sort of respect. <laughs> I've enjoyed making it to elder cinematic <laughs> stage. You know, I, the the upside of that is that, like those first three films, the, the natural thing in an employee situation is the emperor has no clothes. Right? They have no idea what they're doing. They right. have no idea. They're totally faking it. Obviously. And that was even my third film days. That was the vibe at the studio. Oh, this guy's a complete amateur. He has no idea what he's doing and, you know, he's doing it all wrong. And I, yeah, and I could be doing better. You know, that was all there. That slowly started to get away. They might not like what I'm doing, but they couldn't say I didn't know what I was doing. Right. And I couldn't say because, frankly, I didn't. There was a lot I didn't know. <laughs> right. Like, you leave yourself vulnerable. So at some point, <laughs> I was happy to get there. Like, you can disagree or not like, but just don't tell me I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I, my joke is, I, when they ask some obvious question, like, oh, do you, I was like, oh, this only seems like my first film, but it's actually my... <laughs> 20, my 21st. Uh, yeah. You go like, oh, it's, yeah, this might seem like my first film. I had to tell Shirley MacLaine that, like, well, do you have wardrobe? I mean, like, she challenged, she challenges, you know, yeah. in a well, way. In pre-production, I'm like, Shirley, this isn't, Universal. Well, this is an indie film. We don't have any money. This, it's yeah. we're not. We're eight weeks out. I don't haven't even started in the costume department. We don't have, you know, this is, I don't have Edith Head coming over to do costumes. <laughs> like, don't you know, this is an indie film. But just don't tell me I don't know what I'm doing because this is my, you know, thirteen, fourteen film, whatever. You know, so you just have to kind of <laughs> give everybody, you know, their comfort zone or their assurance. Oh, it, it's not going to be wasted, you know. God, as a director, there's so many skill sets that they don't tell you about, like the politics Ooh. of a set, like being Ooh. the politics and and human relationships and oh, just yeah. and the psychology of it all. Like all they teach you is like this is the lens that Kubrick used. Now this yeah. is how Scorsese got that shot in Goodfellas. Yeah, that's, here's the that's fantastic. That's that's like oh, but when you get on set, like that perfect example of Shirley MacLaine, like when you when you run up against the wall, like. Like Shirley, who yeah. like worked with Hitchcock among a million okay. other among a million yeah. other people that she worked with. Everyone we've talked about, <laughs> right? Exactly. You just go. Uh, you they don't yeah. teach you that. That's something you learn on the job. <laughs> Again, I did that eight weeks before production Thank started. God. Or so in a hotel room in L.A. You know, like we got that done. So by the time we were on set. It's it's smooth. You know, everything's right. great. We're making the same movie. We had rehearsed. We had, you know, things were good, you know. Yeah, but, but she didn't have any respect for Vincent Minnelli. So I think you're in really good company. <laughs> right? Well, did she say all she cared about was his, the color of the curtains or something? Yeah, or Hal Ashby was hot. Yeah, I realized, oh, yeah, some people. Yeah, you're in good company. Have good, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know for her because she, she was Bill Wilder. Yeah. yeah. She was like, well, do you want this or this? I said, well, I don't know, Shirley. Which one do you think you're, she said, there you go. I don't know. I said, 
you know, I, I said, I don't, when they're confront, confronting me with something, my first thing I said, I don't know. I mean, everyone else in East Texas has their, I said, listen very carefully to what I say right after I say, I don't know. And I'm probably telling you what I think. But I'm also leaving the possibility that you might have an idea of your own that you want to bring in here and collaborate with. <laughs> which is which is scary for, for a certain generation of, of, of actors. Like they just want to just like tell us where to go. Um, it, it happens. I've worked I've, I've worked with some actors like that too, with an older generation and very established, and you work with them and they just they they have a way of doing things that they well, would just Billy really Wilder, like would Billy Wilder like show exactly or am I thinking of Lou Bitch, where they would just exactly what they wanted, they would act it out. <laughs> I'd and imagine, I'd imagine me. Billy Wilder wasn't a very loosey goosey. No. no, I don't no. think Billy Wilder was no, very no. loosey goosey. I'm thinking of Lou Bitch then. That would just totally act it out. This is exactly what I want you to do and do it. It's like you worse know. than a line you, reading. That'll, that'll, yeah. <laughs> that, but for some I, actors, I, maybe I, that, that <laughs> works. See, I, I have, I get as not shy as I am. I get really shy around actors. So oh. that. I need to work on that. That's, that's my thing. I really, I mean, they, probably Eden and Diane and Danielle would say that's not true, but. Yeah. Um, they smell I fear. Do, they smell I fear. Do, they smell really fear. Like, huh? Yeah. yeah. I really like you. I thought you were giving them a lot. I love the way you work with the actors and the vibe on your set. Oh, uh, good. Oh, uh, that means a lot. And stuff. But yeah, that is true. You said actors smell fear, but that's like, that's why I was always in acting class and I was always right. kind of became an actor myself. Not that I ever wanted to be an actor, but I thought, oh, I want to be able to relate. You know, at least it's good to know enough to know how hard it is. Oh, what they're doing, so you know, hard. so they so hard. So you have a you come from a place of appreciation, empathy, of what acting is and, you know, empathy of how difficult it is. And yeah. you're, you're just, they sense you're on their side, right. you know, there's a reason in sports, most coaches, they always have played. <laughs> they know what yeah. you're up against. They know the situations you're right. in. So wouldn't it make sense for a director to have played the positions before or been in that game? You know, so it, it kind of makes sense. I tell students and people like, oh, go, go get in an acting class, get up in front of 20 yeah. people. Give a five minute or right. three minute log, show your ass of how you're not good <laughs> and live with it and get better and be embarrassed. And because that's what they're doing with for your camera. And they're, you know, you're asking a lot of people because mm -hmm. actors, they can smell it like, oh, are you on my side or do I have to work around you? Mm -hmm. you know, do I have to protect and, myself? Do I have to protect myself? Yeah, yeah. You see, and it really calcifies careers. You see these actors who you know, they go through a long career and they've, they've been burned. You know, mm -hmm. they believed in a director who told them to do something. They see the movie and that's stupid. Why do I look so dumb? Because I listen to that idiot telling me to, you know, and they don't like what they did. So they, they're like, okay, I'm not going to, wh what am I going to give? I'll only give so much of myself or I'll only, I'm not going to go outside. Don't tell me how to act because I've already got all that. Right. Yeah. So... You see, really good actors giving, well, they're not really finding any new notes in their careers. They're just being good over and over in the kind of the same way. But, you know, the best actors, the ones who really push themselves, the ones we're still talking about, you know, they'll be working with a first time director and they're like, they're so confident actually in their own abilities. They're like, tell me, I mean, they know the film's only going to be good if they're good. So they want to help you be good. They're not in opposition. Right. You know, they don't right. want to hire lackey director who just you know they really want a director to you know i like think the best player would like the best coach <laughs> you know that's the way you're going to win right absolutely I tell you what's heartbreaking i just finished reading a biography on clark gable and to hear his experience on the misfits and you know mm -hmm. he would get the set on time he was ready to go and everybody <sighs> would just sort of trickle in and it, it really uh... killed him and I mean, Marilyn was late. Oh, Marilyn. John was late. I mean, he would just be like, what? What type of filmmaking is this? You know, and it's just, it's it's to, to end the book. You know, he's like 60 years old. And this is, you know, after everything he's gone through. And 
it was it was really interesting. I I never I never saw it from that perspective. I guess you know a, an actor who was prepared, ready, and was just getting you know it was just such an awful experience. Well, actors, you do enough films, you're going to have some really weird experiences yeah. based on you're working with and the circumstances they're in right i mean it's like yeah what's his quote like a week or so before he died of a heart attack he talked about misfits like marilyn said she likes to give that she gave me a heart i thought she was going to give me a heart attack well she did maybe so yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it was just, it was so just... so guys uh, this has been an amazing conversation i have a few <laughs> questions i mean i could keep, i could go in for another three hours but um okay. i uh, but I'm, I'm going to give you a few rapid uh, rapid fire questions that I, I ask all my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? I would say don't focus on the business so much. Focus on your own <laughs> getting good. You know, yeah. the business will, the business will uh, come. Yeah, don't be too business or don't be too business oriented. How about that? Think about just what you're doing and make it really good. And then the, or that, you know, I don't know. Is that dumb? No, no, that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Around when it does, but don't, you know, I see these grad students that they're really worried about getting that first one. It's like, you're not even, you're so far away from that. Just perfect <laughs> your own mechanism. How about before you're thinking about your career? Don't even think in, I would say don't think in career terms or business terms. Well, no. Okay. I mean, wasn't it Tarkovsky who said, you know, this isn't a career. This no. Is a cause. Yeah. You know, this, this is it's a I calling. Mean, and, if, and if and it's a calling. And if you look at it from, I think perspective is very important. It's it's you know it's it you know we don't need another <laughs> director making action you know yeah. an action hero you know whatever movies we need more personal visions and i think that's what came out in that great book about chinatown you know it was like yeah. one of the last times that you know there was a, a a personal vision that was brought to the screen so that's my advice and like like we said earlier short films just keep figuring out what what you want to say about yeah. life and and you know if you don't have anything to say yet then get a diary <laughs> get yeah a and write yeah, and, go, and go, go say, do something you know don't. i don't have to go to africa and go on a safari like hemingway or you know <laughs> but put yourself out there you know feel and so you'll have something i mean for me for a long time i just didn't have anything to say you know and that takes you know i did portrait I, I, I wrote that when I was, I don't know, 30. And, and I didn't even really write it. It was just a bunch of loose scenes. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in the film because I didn't even, couldn't even tell somebody how to act in it. Right. I didn't know what yeah. I was doing. So I do think we need to do a little nod to experimental filmmaking. Like mm -hmm. truly, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to use the craft in that way. You know, I'm going to, um, you know, maybe, and I shot over a year, you know, so. Yeah. It's. I, my, I just thought of one thing, like, don't even think of business or career or anybody support until you've found your own voice. And yeah. Until you feel you've, and that can take a long time. Yeah. Some people are maybe born with more of that than others. And that's a combination of your own experience, your own confidence, but you only get that confidence by doing, you know? So mm -hmm. I, again, you thinks it's all going to be given to them, but you know, it's not, <laughs> it's, you know, you're going to have to <laughs> find your own way, but save everybody some time. <laughs> well, amen. Mean, amen. 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 Yeah. You know, Cause I remember thinking that I had a script I was trying to get done. I was like, I was like, yeah, why would anyone invest in me? I haven't done anything. You know, I've done this one shitty, you know, like, yeah, you better just keep on your own path a little longer, you know, like, do something on your own again before you think, put your foot out in the world and expect others to rally around you, you or your, your film or your cause, you know, just do the, do the personal work. It's a wonderful 
freedom. I mean, I remember when you wrote to Monty Hellman about what you wanted to do, and he almost, he envied you. You know, he was like, I envy that that the, you, don't, um, you don't have any constraints. Making, yeah. yeah. And I remember Robert Altman saying the same thing when we brought him to Houston. Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone raised their hand, well, it's easy for you to get a movie made. What about me? And it's like, he said, no, actually, it's not. You know, don't, don't, again, it's this perspective, you know, it's, it's, they know what I've done. You haven't done anything. And, so um, the world is your oyster. I know. He, he said, anyone in this room has a better chance of being financed in Hollywood than I do. Yeah. Right? Oh, <laughs> this was him at that point. You were, <laughs> you were at that. Right. You were at that. Yeah, that was the quote. Yeah. And it was like, he was so right at that moment. At that and, moment. He had just yeah. done Tanner. And he right. got really, I mean, talk about, boy, that was, that was so ahead of its time. Was it Tanner eighty mm eight? -hmm. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and right. and you're looking at this, I'm right you know cinema god and and yeah. So I admire him so much, Altman. Every passing year, yeah. he gets more. I saw, I hosted a screening of Brewster McCloud at the film site. We put it in the Texas Film Hall of Fame last year. Yeah, the last words, Brewster McCloud. Yeah. Oh. And that film is so crazy and wonderful. And I just, you know, just, the respect for Altman, he, he's perpetual. Yeah, and then the inner's mind about him. You just felt like everything was just new and fresh. It's like, oh, jump a high. decade, jump a decade where he's kicked out of Hollywood. Yeah. You know, completely, and he's making, you know, five, Jimmy Dean, yeah. streamer. I watched Secret Honor again recently. Mm. That's really, I mean, this guy was making films for a hundred grand again, Yeah, you know, but he didn't really stop him. I just, I just admire that so he's much. Amazing. You know? so he's I, amazing. Yeah. He's yeah, amazing. Now, um, now what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? <laughs> you both, you both look the exact same way. That's like the answer, question. like the answer's <laughs> over here somewhere. <laughs> I, well, to be honest, I I feel like I haven't, I mean, I just made my first, I mean, I Dream Too Much is my first feature film, so I feel like I haven't even, I barely stepped up to play, you know, as far as filmmaking, um, because Portrait um, was, you know, a 60-minute film, so it was kind of not considered a oh. feature but ask the question again. What is it that? What I is learned? the le the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life in general? <laughs> Still learning that lesson, man. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever. For me, I... for me, it's always been. I, I always say the same thing: patience. That's for well, me. It's like, that's the lesson that I, I finally figured out. Like, okay, this is it's it's gonna take forever. Everything I want is gonna take a while. <laughs> Not as fast as I want it. That's my lesson. That's the one that I've learned. Yeah, well, it's that thing. Whatever you're doing, slow it down. <laughs> you know. You know, I was blessed in that area. I had some weird patience. That I mean, I was impatient internally, but I was patient externally. Like, I always thought a pro I would always ask myself, well, where are you going to be a year from now or a day? You know, I could sit there and build to the future. I keep even sitting down going like at 22 or 23, you know, like, oh, getting a camera and equipment. I was thinking like, OK, well, Godard said it like, oh, they don't let you make your first film till you're 30. So I got, I got seven or eight years. I just kind of put the bar. I just have achievable goals. Like my goal was to do one feature film by the time I was 30. And in fact, when I got there, I'd done two, you know, but it was like achievable goals that you can work really hard for. And like, I don't, I don't know. Patience is definitely required. Don't get anywhere near film if you don't have the trait of deferred gratification. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very much so. Well, how, how yeah. About, existent gratification how about that not even deferred no, it's like, not exist <laughs> yeah because you never but i mean yeah. to be but to be honest rick i mean you're 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 like the king of 
the long play as yeah. far as storytelling is concerned from boyhood to the before yeah, trilogy yeah. like you definitely have delayed gratification <laughs> yeah it turned out that way but i, I didn't have that planned of course, of course but i think right. that is a trait of being process oriented like i love every day that i'm making a movie so much i really do if i could just be i, I was quoted one time saying like if i could just make movies and they never had to come out i would be happy if i could just <laughs> make them like the coming a, out part is the least well, don't you think uh, all the filmmakers are like most filmmakers are like that i maybe i don't I, know uh, not really that I, is the worst part it's it's made for the marketplace and it's and i, mean, I don't know and I, a, it's always said like doing the film society we'd much rather show you yeah. know, something came running than one of one I'd, something we're working I'd, on. I'd much rather talk about another film. Exactly. Oh, you know. Exactly. What's, Let's talk about all that jazz. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the downside of this modern era is so much personality of um, the people involved. You know, like directors in the old studio system and the. You know, it wasn't based. No one knew what a director did. I grew up in an era, right. 60s, 70s. I didn't know who a director was. I, I mean, Hitchcock was the only one we knew, and I didn't know what he did. I just knew that guy was associated with those kind of scary movies or something. Well, I'm reading David Brownlow's book on the silent era, um, Parade Passed By, and they really didn't know what a director was. They just sort of- They were making it up know, as they went along. Yeah. Because it was such a craft, it, and it still is a very yeah. craft-oriented um, mm -hmm. a medium. And so yeah, I do have to say- thing, Yeah. Um, was it the John Cage quote, everyone is in the best seat? I think that took me a long, long time to realize it's a profound that quote. <laughs> is in the best seat. So I think it, it kind of, cause I never yeah. wanted to be in Beaumont. <laughs> yeah. I never wanted to, you know, and that's the nature of creating art or especially filmmaking is you, you want to create a world, you know, that you latch on and you inhabit. So you're not really that happy where you yeah. are. So, but in order to create that, you have to sit down and be happy in the seat you're in. So I think that was something when that clicked in for me, I think I was finally able to create in in film because it's such a it takes so long to make mm -hmm. films, which I think is why I love people in the film business more than any other type of people. Even the worst, I yeah, love film people. And I remember in Austin going to parties where there were a bunch of musicians and no one wanted to talk. And then uh, I would go to a film movie. And that's all we do was talk, talk about what movies we saw, talk about, you know. Yeah. So, Film's the, the best yeah. atmosphere because the people who are attracted to it, it's such an external, it, it's really intelligent, excited people about ideas and stories. Yeah. You yeah. know, whether they just read a magazine, I just love the innocence of like, oh, I just read this great story. I think it'd make a great movie. Yeah. You know, or I, I was like, you know, that's so like the odds of that magazine article they read that they'd be coming a movie or like point oh. zero 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 one. But it happens. And just that impulse, that beautiful impulse to like yeah. fashion this thing bigger and amazing and to tell a story in film. And, you know, it attracts people who are optimistic, who believe that yeah. kind of dream. And want to be in this kind of parallel world. Yeah. Like every crew member, everybody there, they could be doing something else. You know, they could have taken their college degree or they could have, you know, but they're here because they love it. They love storytelling. They love being a part of this, you know, right. nomadic gypsy, you know, camp yeah. of making a movie that they just love that life and I to be a part of the, the magic that, is in the process and you know there's a certain confidence in the world that they want variety they want different people coming in and going you know i tell people like if you want a weekly a check every two weeks and you want a two-week vacation you yeah. really if yeah. you care about things like 
that you can't be in the film business. You have to yeah, like I, the uncertainty, the absolute um, lack of, you know, anything that you can. <laughs> any, really security, can't. any security, any security, any, 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 any. And the industry is going to take it away from you. You're going to go through personal ups and downs. Like, Alex, when you said like, oh, I've had highs and lows. Yeah, I, I think. But I never considered them lows. I considered them like, well, this is a this is where you find yourself. It's like, I mean, it wasn't like physically threatened or harmed. I was just like, oh, this kind of sucks. But I would run into other filmmakers and we'd look at each other and go, can you can you believe how bad it is? Like, you can't get money. Neither can I. And we're like, oh. And then you go like, well, we got lucky by age. We lived through a generation where you could. And then it, it turns around and it, it goes from being like the worst time to being the best time ever. And I think that's kind of where we are today, well, you know, like. Yeah, it's oh. funny. I was watching Age of Innocence with my oh. daughter. Oh, so and, oh, so beautiful. Oh, my I God. I watched so that beautiful. again this summer with my daughter. Oh, so yeah. amazing. That, that's and like the 12th like, time I've seen that. But it was my greatest oh, screening ever. So that film beautiful. just gets more sublime and beautiful. Well, oh. And I. Was, so I always beautiful. wanted to write a little short film about what um, Newland Archer does after he turns away and doesn't mm. go up to the apartment. My daughter said, oh, no, Mom, we want we need to do a series of Madame Olenska pre coming to New York. I oh. want to see her life Ooh. in Europe. Yeah. Oh, that must all oh, you know, I'll see that for the first time. I was like, you know. Well, of course, I, I think that's a great idea, but it's like that actually could get, that actually could be something. You Rick, know I mean? Rick, we, we got to call we got to call Sony, Rick. Let's call Sony. Let's get this. Let's get this project they're going. Amazing. Well, they're because, going into films all the time now. Like, aren't the, the Clarice? They're doing a Silence of the Lambs yeah. show. They're making yeah. a thing about. You go into these iconic movies. You grab a character out and you make a yeah. show about them. So, yeah. Madame Olenska, there we go. Olenska, because I mean, the count was awful. Apparently, oh, yeah. Um, to know how bad. Please don't let her go back. You know the she secretary says something. that. It's like why? What happened? What happened in Italy? <laughs> you know. So, all right, so guys, incomprehensible education. Yeah. Really? What was that? You know. So all right, so this is the last question, um, and it's arguably the toughest question of of the entire conversation. Uh -oh. Three of your favorite films of all time. <laughs> For everyone not watching, Rick's eyes just busted out of his eye, his head. Does it have asked. to be free? Once, when I asked this question, I produced a list of two hundred and fifty films. Three that three hundred. Any of these at any moment could be in my top. So, it was a top ten. I was asked for. Uh, so this, uh, so in this moment, these, depending on the day and how I'm feeling. So today, yeah. today, how you're feeling, this moment in time, how three about, of your favorites. Can we narrow it down and say the films that we showed in films in whatever you want? Country, like, pick a genre. Pick a I don't know. You know. Or what you? <laughs> it's a tough one. Oh, I told okay. you it's a tough one. So films, it's a tough one. The films you're like supposed right to just now, come Rick, say over and here, over. Here it is. The film, like right now, that after we're done with this, that we we had we have no problem just sitting down and watching. Okay. Like just sit down and watch it right now. Three of them. Yeah, you could. Yeah, well, like they say, the one that you're flipping the channels, it's on. You're just gonna watch it from so every, the remote. Yeah. The remote throw. The ro you throw away the remote uh, movie. Okay. At this very moment, but it's based on I've seen so many this summer with my sure. daughters, like watching films again. So I won't say any of those because I just saw. But some the ones I would like to see right this second. Wow. Um, Katie, you can jump in here while I think. <laughs> um, you know, I'm over. I'm overdue a Barry Lyndon screening. Oh, I just saw that a year ago. That's oh. I'm ready to watch Barry Lyndon again. With in mind this thing I'm working on, I'm ready to watch. Um, I just think of certain directors. I'm going to think of more spiritual films since we did talk about that. Okay. I mean, Barry, mm. Barry Lyndon is very spiritual. Any Kubrick film, all. every Kubrick film is spiritual to me as I watch it. As I, yeah. I go to the church of Kubrick. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, I'm kind of in a New York, New York mode too. Just yeah. that kind of relationship. Wow, wow New York, New York. Right. Yeah. We talked about it here, you know, like creative people get together and just mm, mm -hmm, the impossibility mm -hmm. of that, making that work. Yeah, or, that's you know, so uh, sad. In New York, so, so tough. sad. Yeah, so joyous. The musical, I don't know. It's a, it, it pulls something off that's rare. Very rare. Well, in honor of my dad, and he's got his hard hat right back here. Oh, wow. Um, that's beautiful. I have to say Gigi. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. It has, it's a coming of age film, mm -hmm. beautifully. It's, it's a jewel. It's, everything comes together. It's, it's really just, I could, I, perfect, perfect film. Every, every, it hits all the right notes. It, you know, it's so, I can watch that anytime. So there's Gigi. There's Gigi. Um, hey, Gigi. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want this to turn into a painful thing. So we can move on if you like. <laughs> Annie and Alexander. I really, of all the Bergman's films, yeah. I sort of, I break for Fanny and Alexander. It's really so beautiful. And yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I, the one, the one of my favorite Kubrick films is Eyes Wide Shut. And it gets, for me, I absolutely love Eyes Wide Shut. Okay, because... so we have to do we have to do another podcast where all we talk about is Eyes Wide Shut. Yes, I <laughs> love that movie, and to I me, adore, it was Madame Bovary meets Lost Highway. Oh, so um, it's remarkable, yeah. remarkable no, for Eyes me. Wide Shut is amazing. You know, another film that I've I've come around on completely, and I think a lot of people. I mean, I. I didn't dislike it the way others seem to, but watching the great trilogy this summer, my um, uh, Godfather three mm -hmm. is actually uh, so much better. Uh, it's so much. The new better. cut is that the new cut. The new is that the new cut. Are you agreeing with? Me? No, Kay would have been killed. She would have not been allowed to live. First off, yeah. Eli Wallet comes in way too late in the film for him to be oh. any sort of and okay. don't make that film without Robert Duvall. Sorry. Well, they would have had Duvall, but they 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 worked it around. No, it, it's, no. It's, it's 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 completely underrated. It it's it's oh. really a mature middle age I don't know. I I, I totally Love it's a th look. The bottom line. The bottom line is when you have when you're comparing it to Godfather one and two, you really yeah. can't. You can't. You can't win that fight. Like eyes wide shut. How do you compare it to the body of work? You know, it, it was kind of misunderstood in its day. I think Godfather three is ascending. I, I just mark but my word. You think Michael, who kills Fredo, <laughs> is going to allow Kay to live with all that she knows? No. I have to go with David Thompson on this. He, she would be dead. She no. would be dead. Yes. He could do that. I, yes, he could. Listen, okay, we have to come I, up with a third one. Let's just do the one we love. Come on, Rick. Something yeah. ready. Oh, yeah. The Vincent Minnelli. Boy, I bet that's really, I almost hesitate to show that to people post, like, in this era. It was always pushing the boundaries yeah. in the Me Too era, how poorly they treat women or at least yeah, but a couple women you can do like what turner classic movies is doing which is is talking about it reframing it yeah you talk, i mean you, like they did that with the searchers i yeah. mean how, how does how does blazing Sa how does yeah how does blazing saddles come out today like <laughs> well <laughs> i mean seriously but i mean but some game running is so beautiful i do love it it's still a perennial uh, it's okay. always at the top of my lists because, you know, Frank, Dean, Shirley, and uh, I, so. I haven't seen it just lately. I, I want to show it to my, I'm almost scared to show it to my daughters. They won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, yeah, listen, right. I, listen, I, I, I love that this has been like film, <laughs> fil, film geeks united. I mean, it's fantastic that oh. there's been so much debate about cinema and it's almost, it's just been wonderful 
like being a fly. Well, I think everyone listening is like a fly on the wall on a on a just on like just some filmmakers who just saw a movie and are sitting in a in a Denny somewhere at midnight after watching a movie and they're just talking about cinema oh, essentially. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. We used to go to IHOP. Yeah, I hop Denny's. It was whatever that. What was that? Whatever was open at the time. Whatever's near the theater. That yeah, you just. Came uh, out of. But it has been an absolute absolute pleasure. Um, where can anybody? Where can everybody see? Um, I dream too much. Oh right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad I, it's finally getting out there. Yeah. It's, it's had its okay. own. Its my, own little path, hasn't my, it? My producers told me to, and of course I don't know. So it's uh, I definitely. Can, Amazon mm -hmm. and like Hulu, Tubi, and, and, and those Roku kind of places. Yeah, and all the all, all the usual, all the usual places. The, yeah, just all the usual spots. Good spot. Talk to your TV. It's and I will. And I will put a links in the in the show notes. But guys, I really appreciate yeah. you taking the time. This has been an absolute joy. Just geeking out with you guys. Uh, about yeah. cinema We're over. Not geeks. Wait, listen, <laughs> listen. Super just let's call cool. a spade. Let's call a spade We're a spade. Drunk. We're, We're drunk cinephiles. Cinema. We're cinephiles. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, but it's been absolutely wonderful. But thank you so much for your time, guys. I, I truly appreciate it. This yeah, is well, great. great talking, Alex.